Thank you, Ms. Harper. Thank you all for doing this. Uh, this is part of the game we call politics, and it has to be done. Uh, I have enjoyed running around the state, uh, going to different places. I haven't been to every place or every meeting in, in this state, but I've been to a lot of them. My name is Ed Goodwin. I was born and raised in Eaton, North Carolina. I'm a fifth generation farmer there. I was raised on a farm that uh, goes back to my great great grandfather. <laughs> My father farmed there 62 years until he died three years ago. My brother and I both stayed home and farmed, and then uh, I left when I graduated from high school. I went to East Carolina as a young boy who thought he was a man. And I did not pay attention to my studies, and Uncle Sam drafted me because Vietnam was still going on. So I disappeared for a while. You know, 19 years old, you can't tell a 19 year old boy what to do. Uh, and I didn't think it would happen, I guess. But I got drafted uh, in the Army. And I switched to the Air Force. My father, a World War II veteran, told me, son, use your brain. I taught you how to shoot a gun. You got a brother that's three years older than you who's six foot five, 275 pounds. You know how to fight. And he was telling the truth. I did. I, I love to fight with my brother. Still do. Uh, but but we, we do not do it physically anymore. And you know, We agree that you know, it's, it's not worth it anymore. But I spent my time in the service in uh, Air Force. I spent four years in the Air Force. I took a test, like my daddy said. Be smart, use your brain. I took a test and I qualified for nuclear weapons school. So they sent me to school for over a year on nuclear weapons and I became a nuclear weapons specialist. I say that for you to remember that and you'll see why in a minute. When I got out of the service, they called me back. About a month later, I was dressed like this in a suit and they gave me the uh, Airman's Medal for Heroism for something I did while I was in the service. And I didn't, they didn't get the medal approved until after I was back and went back and I received that. That does not mean I'm a brave man at all. Uh, I'm, I'm not a scared man, I'm not afraid, but I'm not brave. There's a difference between those two things. If I had to think for a split second about what I did, I would have never done it. <laughs> because if I told you all the details of it, you would say, that man's crazy. <laughs> it's one of those knee-jerk reaction things you do based upon what you see, and you know, <clears throat> it's just quick, God help me. And that's when you're really serious, you're really being that brutal uh, when you say it at that time. But I came back home, I uh, worked odd jobs, got my head straight, and I went back to East Carolina to finish what I started. I finished, and Uncle Sam recruited me as a special agent with NCIS. He hired me as a special agent in NCIS, and I did that for 23 years. Uh, one of the first things I did after I got kind of intelligence, kind of espionage training and everything, I was picked as an agent to be on a nuclear treaty inspection team. You see the significance of that military training? Well, I was the only person there who had had kind of intelligence, kind of espionage training, as well as nuclear training. Yeah. So I was filling a double role there. So I did that for four and a half years. <coughs> on. I would go and stay anywhere from 40 to 60 days at a time, and I did that for over four years, about four and a half years. I also lived in outside Hiroshima, Japan, five years, and ran operations for the government over there in the Pacific Rim, what we needed to do and uh, how we needed to do it over there. I've lived and worked all over the world in all these godforsaken countries and uh, all over the United States. I've worked undercover in some of the major cities. Uh, you would never think of a man with an accent like this would do good in New York City uh, undercover. <laughs> <laughs> but it was easier than being undercover in Goldsboro, I'll tell you that. It was a whole lot easier, you know, because the people in New York couldn't understand me and couldn't figure me out at the beginning. But uh, I've served on uh, three presidential protective service details, uh, both Bushes and uh, Reagan and several uh, foreign leaders, too numerous to mention, and a lot of the high-ranking government officials in the United States. I retired from NCIS uh, in 2004. I went to work uh, at Blackwater because I was a gun, uh, a firearm instructor, and was very good at it, and I was an unarmed self-defense trained guy. Uh, I was a contract employee. I did not work for Blackwater. They contracted with me to come and teach when they needed me to teach people mainly urban warfare. I was teaching military men and women under contract how to go into a city and enter buildings and clean buildings and arrest people in those buildings. The military are not trained to do that. They start to be trained for that now. But back in 2004, they were not receiving the training for urban warfare like they needed to be trained. So they had a contract at Blackwater. That's what they called men to do. That's close quarter combat. Sometimes you got to use a weapon. Sometimes you cannot use a weapon. You got to use your hands. So. Uh, I always loved to do that. Remember, I told you I had a big brother. So I always <laughs> loved to do that. As a grown man, I was still doing it. But I did get it out of my system. And I did that for about a year and a half. And then I uh, uh, completely left and went home 
and started farming with that. When I got home and I was going to build my house on the farm, I went to the county and started looking at the, I said I want to see the land utilization plans. Uh, I would like to see the other permit requirements and all this other kind of stuff for me to build a house. Things seemed to be out of whack and I couldn't put my finger on it. So I asked to see the county budget. And the finance officer told me you'll have to go to the uh, manager, the county manager, and get that approved for me to give you a copy of the budget. I said, I'm a taxpayer in this county, born and raised here, my family's here, and you mean, oh, I said, that's all right, I'll just go to the library. And he started laughing, he said, we're going to put it in the library. I said, nobody gets a copy of the budget. So I went to see the county manager, he asked me, he said, what are you looking for? <laughs> I said, I, I won't know until I find it. As a trained investigator, yeah. yes. I will know what it is when I find it. Uh, so when I went and I, I ran up against that problem, I decided, you know, I'm going to walk away from this. I'm going to think about it. And then uh, that's about the time God started telling me, put, God puts a thought in my mind. I've never heard his voice. But God puts thoughts in my mind. I try to pray him away. Get other people try to help me pray him away. It won't go away. That means he wants me to do something. So it stayed on my mind. I talked to my father before he died about it and everything. He said, well, there's a lot of trouble in this county. You just come home. You just find out about it. We've known it for a while. Mm -hmm. He said, it's going to be tough. It's going to take the best out of you. You're going to be the sorriest human being ever come to this county if you run and win. When I looked at this, I said, then how bad can it be, right? <laughs> so I ran in the year of Obama against a minority female. I'm dumb as I look. I know in the year of Obama, in a Democratic-controlled county, never had a Republican chairman on the county commissioners there in history. The full board was nothing but Democrats. Uh, I ran and uh, captured 70% of the vote. So I said, hmm. So between the time I ran and won and the time I was sworn in, it was the night that Chowan County was in financial distress. Bankrupt. And the state would take us over and the state would do all kinds of things to us, raise taxes to get it just right. And we looked and we had blown a lot of money. We were in trouble. Now from the time the election was held to the time I got sworn in, the Board of Commissioners and the county manager at that time, the other county manager, he, when I won the primary uh, against a rhino that was uh, on the board at that time, uh, he retired. So that whole summer, uh, I had to sit there and have a little conversation with God. Why did you do this to me? You know, <laughs> the county is bankrupt. What in the world could we do? Couldn't pay the bills, and we were millions and millions of dollars in debt, and we had no money. The state requires you to at least have eight percent fund balance. That's one month of operation. They really like for you to recommend you have about twenty-five percent. We had nothing, and we couldn't make. <coughs> so people got together and started working. Then when I got sworn in, they elected me chairman, and I've been chairman for the last four years. <coughs> Now, why in the world would a Democratic board elect a Republican chairman and a vice chairman, another Republican, who came in in the year Obama, the same time I did? Because they're smart. Yeah, <laughs> if we could not fix it, they could blame it on us, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Them daggum Republicans, you know? Uh, but that's not really uh, what happened. But that, that, that sign is good when you say it. But I will say this. that uh, Those five Democrats on that board and the two Republicans, uh, we put that aside. We had uh, a common cause. We were united to fix our kind, fix our home. And we did. It was not pretty sometimes. It was ugly. It was a lot of troubling votes. A lot of troubling votes. There still is some troubling votes, but we're doing the hard work, the heavy lifting. So in the Choma County, the smallest county in uh, land mass in the, in the state, 14,785 people in the county. And we were $32 million in debt, and we had no money. Well, uh, we just passed the last budget last Monday. I came back from vacation just to have the uh, county commission meeting Monday 9 o'clock in the morning, and we passed the budget, and the budget was less this year than it was last year. Uh, I promised the people that, I, well, I didn't promise, I said I was shooting for 25% fund balance before I got off the board December 1st. Uh, we will have 23% fund balance. So we went, in the last three and a half, four years, we went from minus money to we have 23% fund balance. We pay all our bills. We renegotiated all our debts uh, and paid it, all, paid it all down and worked it and did some things where we would talk to an institute of government, the local government commission out of Raleigh. They said, I don't know whether you can do that or not. I said, it's against the law. We don't think so. I said, fine. 
I'm not asking permission. I just go do it, and then I ask forgiveness. <laughs> but, but, and a lot of people say I can't believe all of this stuff. What a little bit I told you right now. It's hard to believe. I'm a farm boy from Eastern North Carolina. How in the world did I ever get fortunate enough to do what I'm doing? My daddy told me, he said, only in the United States of America is that how. He said, with this right here, I have taught you something. You can have anything in the world you want. You know what that is? Hard work. He said, I gave you a good name, and I taught you hard work. Hard work to get you anything. So I talked to my brother about running for uh, statewide office. And I had picked the Secretary of State's office because I think that's the position on the Council of State where I can make the biggest impact the quickest. So I talked to my brother, my business partner, on the phone, and I said, uh, I'm thinking about doing this. He said, I knew it was coming. <laughs> <laughs> I said, are you sure? You've been encouraging me all along. And I said, I don't want us to stop following because I'm going to run for statewide office. He said, don't worry about it. He said, you risk your life for your country for 27 years. You put your name and reputation on the line for your kind. You know what? That was hard. Because those people were my people. Relatives, supposedly friends. It's tough. I'm still as sorry as you know what has ever come through that. <laughs> I had a woman uh, tell a friend of mine to tell me for sure. She said, I'm going to vote for him as Secretary of State. I just want him out of the county. <laughs> <laughs> Now, we laugh about that. That's not, that didn't, I didn't take that as an insult. Because if you constantly try, Representative Dixon, you know this, if you constantly try to do the right thing, they will talk trash about you. They will talk trash about you. <clears throat> How long have you been talking trash about Republicans or conservatives, people who want to do the right thing yes. all the time? They'll talk trash about you. But then in this primary, a statewide primary, I won 76 kind out of 100. Uh, when I won my kind, I didn't think I'd get that high percentage of votes and everything, but I beat the nearest competitor in my kind by about 78% of the vote. So it's not that many people, but still, uh, that went on. But talking to my brother about it, and uh, he, he told me to do it. And then I said, I don't know, I still got some problems with concerns. And then he said the magic sentence that really got me. What would your daddy say? Now, my conservative values and what I know came from my mom and dad, grandparents, and the people that work on the farm with us. We had 127 acres of tobacco, and we pulled it by hand. Guess who the number one and two primers were every day? <laughs> <laughs> Daddy said, my boy, y'all feel sick, it's too hot for you, my boys can handle it, come on boys. <laughs> we had to do it. He said, when I was your age, I pulled two rows. I said, okay. <laughs> but I do think I can make a difference uh, as Secretary of State. I think I'm qualified for it. I think I have the experience for it. What I say, I can. I think I can do. And my conservative days, I can prove it.